Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I'll give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to JT. He was originally born and raised in the U.S., but then for the past more than a decade, he has been in New Zealand. So he's got a lot of different things going on, travel, culture, and he is the host of the podcast, The Paranormal Son. So I'm sure we'll talk about that as well, among other many other topics. I'm excited to learn more about JT and get to know him. So JT, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for having me on your program. I do appreciate it. So that said, I'm originally from the U.S., as you say. I'm originally from the mighty Pacific Northwest. I grew up in the mountains and forests, and uh, when I was Around 12 or 13, we moved to the Midwest, and I went to school in Illinois, went to school in the Midwest, and then I moved to Southern California and lived there for about 10 years, and then I moved here overseas to New Zealand. So I've been all over the U.S. I haven't spent a lot of time on the East Coast, but pretty much everywhere else I've I've been to all over the U.S., obviously a long time ago. But uh, yeah, we were we weren't a military family, but when I was growing up. We always moved around a bit, it seemed like. I mean, the longest I've ever lived in any one place uh, before I lived here was 12 years. So we just seemed to be one of those families that moved around a bit. So when people say to me, for example, oh, how how did you move overseas? If you want to know the truth, how I moved overseas, I, I will tell the backstory. But I basically took two suitcases and $1,000 uh, and left. So that's how I moved overseas. It wasn't one of those things in hindsight that you would encourage someone to do. But at the time, as we often do, uh, I rolled the dice and it's the best thing I ever did. I'm I'm really glad that I did. So can you tell us the backstory of why New Zealand? Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, so I I've worked. I started working at 13 years old. And I've worked in the food industry pretty much my whole life. I've had a few jobs that might be one step removed from food. So what I mean is maybe you're not working in a restaurant or you're not working on a farm, but we'll be supplying stuff to farmers. And I was working for a large grocery chain at the time in Southern California, uh, and we had a massive strike. We had a five-month-long strike, and it was all about health care as Everyone knows in the U.S. it's been a hot and contentious topic for a long time. So we had this huge strike. We went back to work, and basically we found out that they'd cut all of our everything that we'd worked for. So, for example, vacation time, um, pay, all of that was all cut. So if you got promoted after this strike, then you were basically like a B. You were on a B-grade contract. And so at that point, um, I, I'd worked for them for six years, and that was my career. That was the plan. And um, I'd met someone here in New Zealand. I'd met my partner here, and I really literally did the whole what the hell. Um, if it doesn't work out, I can always come back. And that's that's exactly what happened. I thought about I'd, – I'd never been here before. In fact, um, I'd only been out of the U.S., to uh, Tijuana, to tell you the truth. I'd never left the U.S. So, you know, when a lot of people say, wow, you just picked up and moved. But that's what it was all about. It was just go and see what it's like. I had encouragement from my parents, especially my mom. You know, my mom said to me, you've got pioneer blood in you. Um, just go for it. And like I say, not that there hasn't been some adjustment, especially early on. It was really difficult because it was so different. And back at that time, it, the world wasn't as, yes, there was the internet obviously, but the world wasn't as interconnected as it is now. Like things like what we're doing right now, you couldn't do that back then only with a phone call. So when I first got here, we didn't have cable, the country did, but we didn't have cable. And it was like landing on the dark side of the moon. You didn't hear things that were going on in the U.S. You didn't hear what was it, it was such a juxtaposition to go from obviously living there to just 
feeling like you were in in the international uh you know the space station or something and like i say early on especially it was a bit of adjusting and getting used to but um yeah within within an, i don't know a year maybe two years i knew that this is where i wanted to be and so what sort of things are different that you did have to adjust to that now is kind of more normal life for you everything from like you were saying before when just before we were recording everything from the accents so for you know for example there's an old saying that is an excellent saying to this day i can't remember who said it it might have been churchill but when he would talk about um the uk and the us he would say two countries separated by a common language and that is 100 percent true uh it, like everybody, uh, well, not everyone, but a lot of people think that like New Zealand and Australia are the same place and we're completely different. It's like saying Canada and the US are the same country. It's two different cultures. And so getting used to things like that. And the other thing is here, as much as we always, at least me growing up, we always heard the US is this big melting pot. And I'm not saying it isn't, but I'll tell you this much. I've known so many more people here from so many different places in in uh as compared to in the US. I mean even in California which is supposed to be this big melting pot. One of the companies I worked at we did a poll and it was just in our supply chain so it was only part of the company and the poll was what's your nationality and we had like 56 different nationalities working uh all in all in this in this one section of our company. So yeah, it's, it's, and to me, I'm one of those people, first off, um, I'm, I'm three quarters, quote unquote, European and I'm a quarter American Indian. So most of my family lineage were immigrants anyway, even though some of them go back to the Mayflower. So I'm, I've always been a strong believer that immigration makes a country stronger and it's all of those cultures together that makes a country what it is. And there are people here, just like there are in the U.S., that don't necessarily believe that. But I'll tell you what, it really makes New Zealand unique, especially I, I basically live in the city that has a third of the country's population. So this is, I'm not saying everywhere in the country is this big melting pot, but definitely Auckland is. And I, I mean, it's been great because some of the people growing up, um, like I'm from Generation X, and you know we grew up, we were told... Oh, the Chinese are our enemies, the Russians are our enemies, the Vietnamese are our enemies. And guess what? I've had friends from all of those countries now that are my age, so they grew up on the other side of the line being told the same things. And it's been great to just get to know those people and ask them questions like, during the Cold War, what did you guys get told? And they'd say the same thing. Oh, you guys were going to invade us and you were going to, you know, you're going to burn the country down, you're going to rape our women and... So it's it's just you get to know these people just like anything and you remove the stigma of of what you're told someone is versus what someone actually is. And it I, I mean, it's been great. It's if you like I say, really, if you would have told me growing up, you're going to live overseas, are you really going to enjoy it? I, I would have laughed because I would have said, yeah, whatever. I'll never because I think most people in the U.S. Um, I can't speak for now, but in my generation, especially we were always told that it's the only place to be really. And, and, and I don't mean that in any mean term, of course, uh, I, I love my country. I love where I'm from, but all I'm saying is we were always taught that it's like the U S is the best place and everywhere else is like a close second, but it's look, it's, it's that old saying it's different strokes for different folks. And this country isn't the best for everyone, but for me, it's been the best place. I mean, and again, it doesn't mean I don't miss home. I don't miss people. I don't love people. But I mean, for me, it's been great. And I've been really glad that I've I've had this opportunity to be here. And so you mentioned that, you know, there's kind of this wrong opinion, I guess I'll call it that um, Australia and New Zealand are, are one in the same. So can you explain a little bit of those differences? So and 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 it's great because I can give you a very excellent parallel example which is the U.S. and Canada. Now, again, I've been gone quite a while, so I'm not sure how public thoughts or the zeitgeist has been about it. But when I was growing up, it was you know, everyone would always laugh about when you talk about Canada because they'd always say, oh, they're like our poor little brother or kind of like the backwater compared to the U.S. 
Well, that's how Australians tend to look at us in New Zealand. But um, at the same time, I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, but he's still my family. And if you pick on him, you're going to have me to deal with. And New Zealand and Australia have always had that kind of connection. So it's like we can make fun of them, but it, but you can't. So um, I've, I've worked in Australia. I've known lots of great people in Australia. I've got a lot of listeners in Australia. But, you know, we still have fun. And there's things like there's cert- it, it's no different than Canadians. So, you know, you'll say how Canadians say a boot or there's other things they say or certain. It's the same with Australians and um, and Kiwis and Australians. They've got some things like they enunciate certain words and certain letters. And we can always tell, especially on TV, when somebody's presenting, you say straight away, oh, that's an Aussie. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of little differences. And one of the biggest differences is. Uh, again, like I say, like Australians look at themselves as more of the big time or more of the, the, the like they're they're the big boys on the world stage versus us. But the thing most people don't know, we're over 1500 miles from Australia. And a lot of people have this picture in their head that it's like we're just across, you know, we're just across this little bit of water. But it's it's like a six hour flight from here to Australia. OK, <laughs> it's it's a long way. And um, uh, there's lots of jokes. I know one that was a true story from a cab driver I knew. He had a businessman come here from the U.S. in the 90s, and he was in town for a conference or whatever. And he said to him, oh, take me across the bridge. So he goes, OK. And he takes him across the Harbor Bridge. Um, and he goes and, and he looks at him and he goes, he could see the he could see the businessman's face was like kind of disappointed and he goes no 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 what are you doing and the cab driver goes what are you talking about he goes take me across the bridge take me across to australia you know he goes over to the opera house and that and the cab driver just started laughing and he goes look there's not enough cement in the country to build that bridge and again this businessman who is obviously a worldly person he had no idea how far away it was but yeah we're we're quite a long way from australia and and like i say it it is something i understand if you've never been here you don't know anyone here but we're as far away as Hawaii is from the West Coast, basically. So it's a long way from here to Australia. Um, but yeah, again, like from a cultural thing, there's little things like um, one of the things here that's like a cultural dish is a it's it's think of like a pot pie, but like a homemade pot pie. And here that's like one of the big breakfast. Like um, I don't know about Pennsylvania, but on the West Coast, a lot of people eat breakfast burritos in it here. People tend to go to a, what we call a bakery and you get a pie, like a meat pie. It might have chicken. It might be steak and cheese or what we call mince and cheese, which is like, um, you know, like like hamburger type gravy. And we always laugh about Australians because their pies in comparison to ours are terrible. They taste like salty. Um, they taste like, uh, you know, like miso soup pies. And. The whole time I was there, I never found a good pie. And we always used to, you know, like at work, we'd have good banter and tease the people at work about it. And they'd say, well, you know, uh, why, don't, why don't you go back home then if you don't like it here? Yeah, I'd say, well, I will, but they won't let me yet. I've got to finish my job. So, yeah, th- there's lots of fun, though. Like I say, not every Canadian American have, have that kind of banter, but it's very similar like that. It's big brother, little brother. Yeah, that's really great. And I actually am someone who prior to uh, getting on this call with you was like, I need to know where New Zealand is. um, Because world geography is not a strong suit of mine. Um, And and as you were talking about the bridge, I'm like, yeah, I looked at that map, it was it was not a close distance. Um, New Zealand is significantly smaller in landmass than Australia, but like, there's a lot of space. Um, so do you, obviously just with like the landmass, you know, you were all over the U S do you get off of the islands very often? No. Um, when I was, when I was working, uh, sometimes I'd have business trips and when we had, because one of the great things here is that, uh, as opposed to the U S things are much more centralized. And, and, and what I mean by that is, in the U.S., for example, um, vacation is determined by your employer, so they don't have to give you vacation. I mean, when I worked in the supermarket, uh, the deal was for us, I think it was you had to work there two years to get a week's vacation paid. You had to work there five years to get two weeks and so on. Well, here, it doesn't matter if you're a street sweeper 
or you're a CEO, everyone gets four weeks paid vacation. Uh, you don't necessarily have to take it, but you you can get paid in lieu or you can save it up to a degree. So when I've went on vacation in the past, I've tended to actually go to the Pacific Islands because I, again, being from the U.S., I've never been to the Pacific Islands. So that was one of the things I wanted to do. And I've still got lots of places on the bucket list I want to go to. I haven't had a chance to go to Asia and I haven't had a chance to go to Europe. But without, you know, we're, we're making ends meet, but we don't have a lot of extra money. So we're not going on vacation. But secondly, with COVID, obviously, n don't really feel like going anywhere anyway, because we're, we're really lucky here. We've been fortunate. Um, our government, and I, I won't go too in, in, in depth into it, but our government has done some things really well, and they've done some things poorly. But the thing about COVID, a massive advantage we have is that, again, we're on these islands, and... The thing is, one of our issues that we've had through history has been isolation. But in an instance like this, it's really a good thing. It's like being in Iceland or Greenland. You know, you are you've got a long, a long separation, and you can get here by ship, but you're not just going to turn up in an outboard boat and you know turn up with COVID. It just is not going to happen. We're a long way, and the seas are very rough here. So. Um, yeah, I, I have, but I haven't got I, I haven't gotten to like Europe or anything like that yet. But again, it it's one of those things where I think people don't realize how large New Zealand is. Yes, it's a couple of islands, but New Zealand is as large as the UK. Um it's it's actually quite large. To drive from the very top of the North Island to the very south of the North Island is about 16 hours. So, I, I mean, we we are a decent amount of land. Yeah, it's just those those maps that throw you off and put you uh, right next to Australia, uh, which is, you know, a la lots of land with little people in certain areas. <laughs> and and then on top of that, you've got what they call, I think it's called like the, it, it's it's like the Mercator effect and things that are closer to the top and the bottom of the globe look smaller. You know, because you look at Canada, Canada is a massive country, but when you look at it on a globe, it doesn't look that big. Um, Russia stretches across, so it looks a lot bigger. And so we're so, a lot of people don't realize quite how far south we are, but we're so far south, we're basically the jumping off point for most of the expeditions to Antarctica. I mean, the U.S. flies the planes here and then flies to Antarctica, so you know that we're 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 a, one of the closest countries, and I still think even from here it's like a twelve hour flight to Antarctica. Yeah. Now I don't have a good transition, but I'm going to transition uh, to talk about your podcast um, because it's a very interesting topic that you've decided to peruse. So can you tell us about your podcast? Yeah, of course. So I'll, I'll give you a bit of a background about how it all started. Um, and it'll, it'll help you understand, I think a bit about how the paranormal sun has come to be. So when I first saw, I lost my job before the kind of pandemic really happened. In fact, I lost it a month before, if I would have lost it a month later, I would have been eligible to at least get some money from the government, but I lost my job at the beginning of February, um, as opposed to March. If it would happen in March, yeah, I would have gotten, at least I would have gotten paid for a few months, but in the end, I got nothing. Uh, any, anyway, I mean, it is what it is. But after, because I've always been a workaholic. I, I, I mean, I've been one of those people. I've worked more 100-hour weeks in my life than I can count. I mean, 80, 100-hour weeks. There's been times where I've worked 50 or 60 straight days every day. So when you suddenly take a person like that and you just remove work, it can be quite um, disconcerting because it's like everything you've got as a reference point is just removed. And it's like, now you've got your days to do what you want. So early on, um, one of the things on my bucket list I've always wanted to do was to write a book. And I started kind of planning a book, but me being me, I never do things in half measures. I never do things simple. So instead of doing something like writing a 40 page travelogue type book, 
oh no, I started planning like not just a book, but a series of books and it's, it's still shelved. I haven't done it, but basically I started getting into it and I was like, this is going to be like a massive, massive undertaking. And in the meanwhile, there's a guy here in town who's got what we call a takeaway shop, which in the US you kind of a to-go restaurant. He does have seating, but it's not like fine dining. And he started doing a podcast using Anchor. And I'm not plugging Anchor. I'm not actually, I'm not with Anchor anymore. But the thing was, the whole point of it was I didn't realize how easy it was to do a podcast by then. Because literally with my iPhone, as I said, I recorded my first several episodes. And that program is still around. It's on permanent hiatus. And I'll explain that as well. But that program was called The Fortunate Son. And the the whole point of The Fortunate Son was, like, that's the name of the show. I wanted to tell people how fortunate I felt in life. Yes, I've worked hard, don't get me wrong, but how fortunate I felt to be in the situations I've been in, know the people that I've known, get the advice I've needed when I've needed it, etc. And the whole tagline of the show was exploring the meaning of, uh, well, not the meaning of life. So sorry, I'm just trying to remember. It's been a while since I've recorded an episode. Something like um, exploring the human condition and the meaning of life, something like that. So what does that mean? It means everything, right? So everything from my my life story, where I've been, travel, food, music, just everything, open-ended. In fact, I wanted to name the show Everything But The Kitchen Sink, but that was already taken. So within a few episodes of recording, I very quickly worked out that there were kind of two streams for the show. There was one stream of what I was really passionate in helping people with, which were things like anxiety and mental health and depression. So like I'm a clinical depressant. I've lived through it since I was quite young. And one of the things was letting people, and especially a lot of uh, males my age and older who have been told you have to be a man, you have to be strong, you can't talk about these things basically telling them you're not alone and you need to talk to people. Um, and I've always said, and to this day, as a matter of fact, if you've got no one to talk to, you've got me. Get a hold of me. I'll talk to you. Um, so I had that. And then the other segment was this thing that I've always been interested in, which is the paranormal, unexplained mysteries. So not just UFOs and ghosts, but lost treasures, histories, mysteries, like where did Amelia Earhart go? Things like this. And I very quickly worked out to kind of cram all of this into one show was going to be difficult. So I split, I split the streams, for lack of a better term, and I decided, right, so if I've got the fortunate son, let's have the paranormal son. And if in future I had an, another program, I would try and have it under that umbrella of the, the something or other son. So if I wanted to do books, it'd be the literary sign. If, if you get the drift, then people can kind of follow along and go, okay, that's JT because it's still under this umbrella. And I've always, but I've always been interested in this stuff from, I mean, literally as long as I can remember, I started reading at about five or six and we had, again, it's just one of those kind of things in life where we had, we, we didn't have a lot of money, grew up in the country, but we had this kind of really eclectic or bizarre home library where we had all of these books and paperbacks from the 40s, 50s, 60s. And some of these books now you can't find or they're thousands of dollars. I remember reading books like uh, Flying Saucers Are Real uh, from Frank Edwards, I believe it was, and, and all these different things. And, and so from a very early age, I got interested in the mystery of it all. And then, of course, in the 80s, we started getting things like In Search Of, uh, but more importantly, for most of my generation, it was Unsolved Mysteries. And that started coming on. That's back when we had only the three channels. We didn't have cable TV. So every week when Unsolved Mysteries came on, I'd get really excited to find out something new. And then as I got older, it, it was just one of those things where I think that is what draws most people into this be it UFOs, be it Bigfoot or whatever. It's just that that mystery, the mystery of it all. And it's like, can it be that everybody who sees lights in the sky is drunk or crazy or seeing things they didn't wear their glasses? Or is there something more to it? And 
I try to approach the show in a very even-handed manner. So the whole basis of the show is I've researched this case. So, for example, in Pennsylvania, you've got the very famous Kecksburg case. Now, I haven't covered that yet, but I'll go and I'll do my research. I'll present the information, and it's presented very much in the manner that if there's a theory, I'll say some people think this, some people think that. I've got my own feelings like we all do, but I do my absolute best not to let that you know, I, I never get on and say, this is absolute BS. I might get on sometimes and say, take this for what it's worth, or you might want to take this with a grain of salt, because they're, on both sides of the aisle, there are some pretty outrageous claims. But I do my absolute best to, at the end of the day, the, the decision is up to the listener. It's up to you what you believe, if you think there's something more to it, or you think it's BS. And that's how I present every episode. And then I also do. Each week, uh, almost every episode, I do a segment called The News of the Damned. And there was a gentleman in the early 1900s named Charles Fort, and he's one of the first people that really started gathering these information on like people seeing strange things in the sky, or sea monsters, or like strange rains, frogs raining from the sky, or fish. And he called anything that science excluded or ignored damned data. That's why I call it The News of the Damned. And so we try and have some kind of what's going on in the quote unquote paranormal or unexplained world for lack of a better term. And I try and have fun with it. So we'll have some serious articles. And then like this last episode, I had one about uh, a guy who's saying he's a time traveler and he's stuck in 2027 and yet he's stuck in 2027 and he's releasing videos on TikTok. And it's like, okay, how does that work? <laughs> he's saying it's the end of the world in 2027, but he's releasing TikTok videos. <laughs> Oh boy. So, um, do you have guests on your podcast as well, or is it mostly you and your research? Good question. And I do try and have a good mix. Um, uh, early on, this is the reality. I always try and be honest and I always try and be genuine with my audience. And the truth was early on, number one, I thought doing remote recording and having guests was going to be too hard. And number two, I thought, who is going to want to talk to this crackpot way down here on the edge of the map in the middle of nowhere? Well, the answer is no one, right? Absolutely the opposite. Especially when I, I, was, really, I was really astounded when I started reaching out to people in this field who I've always kind of looked up to. What I thought I was going to get would be generally go away. Who are you? Just just go away. Leave me alone. But the truth, and I fully expected to have people emailing me going, how big is your show? And what's your, I've had none of that. Like it's been, it's been so amazing to me that I've had people that I've read their books. I've looked up to them. I've listened to them and on, you know, podcasts all over. And they're, they're more than happy to come on and talk about this stuff. And I've had everyone from kind of that, like authors who have written hundreds of books, literally, you know, like when you talk about this subject and it's like the guy who wrote the book on it, I've had the guy who wrote the book on it to just people like you and me who are interested in these things. And, and as I was saying before, in your state, in Pennsylvania, there's a really great person I've gotten to know on Instagram. Um, I am on all social media, but Instagram's kind of where I live most of the time because I've found the interactions there have been the best for me, and I've met the most uh, awesome people there. And this guy's named Nate Odd, and he's kind of an urban explorer. And he came on for two or three segments about Pennsylvania and different urban legends and kind of myths and stories in Pennsylvania. And again, we never say, oh, this is 100% a myth, but we'll say all signs point to this is a story, okay? And again, folks, it's up to you at the end of the day, but look, all signs are pointing to this was a story made up to scare people. Um, so yes, I've had a lot of guests and I do try and balance it. So I do seasons and I see this all the time in podcast groups and people are like, why do you do seasons? Blah, blah, blah. The reality is, you know why I did seasons? I thought it sounded cool to have seasons. So that's why I did seasons. But um, I try and mix up each season and have like, a few guest interviews and quite a few of me doing research. I do have several interviews in in the can, as the saying goes, that I've got to get to and edit. And that's what I always say to guests, like, don't 
no offense, but don't think that your show's coming out this week because that's that's not how it is. It's just going through and editing my own work is no problem. But when I'm going through and editing guests, my theory has always been if a guest is coming on my show, they're doing me the favor and I want them to sound the absolute best they can, whether it's just taking out repeated words or breathing or I want the audio because I want to present their best possible uh, face to my audience. So I always take a bit more time when I'm audiencing guest interviews. But yeah, and it's been great. It really has because when you're a solo podcaster, and I know that you understand this, there's great things and there's some things that aren't so great. And one of the great things is in New Zealand and in the UK, we've got cricket. And in cricket, you've got the captain of the team, but no different than you've got a captain on a ship. Well, when you make an executive decision, we say you make the captain's call. Okay, because you're the captain. Well, with this, I'm the captain. It doesn't matter. I make all the calls I want. I make the decisions at the end of the day. But the other thing is, if you're sick or if you're not feeling well or you're just not up to it, you don't have anyone else to kind of rely on. It is 100% on you. And with me, I, I do take it very seriously. I mean, I don't make money from the show, but I always feel like even if I've got a reason, like uh, not too long ago, we had the power out and we had the internet out. I still felt so guilty about not being able to get an episode out because I I never want to let down the people who are tuning in each week and taking the time to listen to me. And on every episode that I, some, sometimes it's like, I'm going to keep this short and we're going to get to the interview. But on just about every episode, I'm always thank the listeners because again, I never would have thought that I'd have people. I've had people from just shy of 70 countries listen to the paranormal sun now and all but three states in the U S and to me, that's just astounding. I, I never would have thought I'd have that many people actually interested in what I have to say. Yeah, that's really awesome. Now, when you started podcasting, you had the other podcast where you were doing a little bit of this stuff and the mental health stuff. So what is it, um, you know, you mentioned that you've lived your life with clinical depression. So what is it that you were doing to help other people? A lot of it was just basically sharing my story and, and just telling people because never underestimate that sometimes people just need to hear. Uh, I'm not the only one who's been through this or um, I'm not the only one in the world that feels this way especially when you're younger, because you don't have the life experience to be able to look back at things and say, this has happened before. I've been through this before. I'll get through it. And I think everyone who's struggled as a teen, like I did, I mean, I went through a time where I literally just got out of bed to kind of do the, the necessities of life. And then I'd go back to bed. I just didn't want to go to school. I didn't want to do anything. And I put my mom through hell, basically, because she was just convinced I was going to take my own life. And obviously, I didn't. And I'm really glad that I didn't. But that was the whole idea was that letting people know that one, you're not alone in what you're dealing with. Two, it's, it's okay to be different. Okay, it's okay to people look at you on the outside, and you're a different person inside. And three, Reach out to people. I mean, I know it's not the easiest thing for, for people, but if you don't want to talk to anyone you know or you live in a small town, you're like, I can't talk to anyone, get a hold of someone on like a helpline or something. And like I say, I'd always put the email out there and I'd say to people, get in touch. If no one else is there to talk to you, get in touch with me. I'll listen. I, I'm here. I've been there before. I've had people listen to me as well in my life. So it's the least I could do. Um I've had people in my life, loved ones and, and people close to me take their own lives. And I always say to people, take your time. Don't, don't take a permanent solution to a temporary problem. So because someone's just broken up with you or because you've just lost your job or because you've just found out that you've got some horrible disease, don't go and take your life immediately. I mean, yeah, I'm not saying those things are great, but all I'm saying is, Oftentimes, when you take a step back and you absorb it and all of that, you cope with it a bit different. And I, I do my absolute best. Again, one of the things I always say on my shows is 
I try my best, but I'm a human and I'm a hypocrite. Okay. So I'm far from perfect. Uh, I am not the answer, man. I don't have everyone's answers. But what I do say to people is at the end of the day, almost everyone has got someone in their life who cares about them enough to listen. And if they don't, like I say, get, get a hold of me, get in touch with me. I'll do my best to, I don't have the answers, but I'll at least listen to what you have to say. And I'll do my best to empathize with it. And one of the reasons why that program, and, and thank you, because this is an excellent lead in to where, what happened with the fortunate son. One of the things I've found out, I've always known it, but I didn't know this term until the last few years. So I'm an empath and I didn't actually know what that term meant, but I'm one of those people like when I have conflict, be it at work or whatever, afterwards, I, I just feel completely washed out. I feel drained of energy and everything else. And what was happening was I was getting on the show and I was talking about things like um, like the riots in the summer in the US and you know the social unrest. And I would finish the show and I would just feel drained, like just like my battery was emptied. And so between that and just the paranormal sun picking up, I couldn't handle both shows like full time. And so when people say to me about the fortunate son, I always say it's on permanent hiatus, but, but that's changed. And the reason that's changed is programs like your own. The reason that I could take a step back from the fortunate son and leave it be was I knew there were excellent programs out there like this and like some others that I've been on. And so what I'm saying is I knew there were other people working in this space, excellent people. It's not like I didn't feel at that time, like my voice would be missed. Uh, but after doing a few of these interviews, I've decided to do a bit of a reboot on the show, but I'm going to handle it in a way I can manage it. So it's going to be interview only, like what we're doing right now, because that way it's not me doing a monologue and I won't feel so drained. And because it's about our journey of life and human condition, we can talk about anything we want. We're still on topic. And the other thing I've said to people is, you're not getting an episode a week. or It's when I can do it. But basically, I'm going to start because I just don't want to end the show by kind of going, this is the last episode I did and I walked away. When the time comes to wrap the show up, I want to do a proper send off. I want to do a finish episode for it. So um, I, I am kind of rebooting it because I this is why I appear on shows like this, because, you know, people will say to me, oh, surely, what, you know, you're a paranormal guy and, and I hate pigeonholing. They'll go, you're the UFO guy. You're the paranormal guy. Why are you going on mental health shows? Because it's near and dear to my heart. Because not only have I went through it, but I've seen so many other people suffer. So that's why I always hold a space for this anyway. And then, like I say, when the time comes to wrap up The Fortunate Son anyway, I'll still happily appear on any program like this if someone wants me on. And that's really great that you're going to be able to do that in a way that better like respects your time and your mental health, because that is so important, especially with those sort of topics. Now, um, and you don't, of course, have to answer this question, but would you mind talking a little bit about what depression is like for you now that you are older compared to life when you were young? Yeah, of course. Um, and that's one of the things about me. I've, I always say about like, especially with coworkers and then that in the past, people are always, you know, they're not sure where boundaries are, but I live my life as an open book. There's almost nothing that I won't talk about. There are a few things, but I mean, you really have to probe to find things I won't talk about. Um, depression for me and living with depression as I've gotten older, one of the key things that I've known is I know when it's coming. I know when it's when it's starting to onset. It's almost like people who have asthma or allergies or even like I like I suffer from migraines and I have my whole life. And when you start getting migraines, you feel it or all like a cold when you start you start feeling sick and you see it coming. That's how depression is for me. Now again, it's not the same for everyone. But I know when it's getting started. My depression is not, now generally, there have been times in my life where I've been really low, but my depression is not so much, uh, somebody cut me off, now I need to go and take a bottle full of pills and take my life. It's not like that. 
it's very much like it's that whole why bother what's the point of anything what's the point of getting up what's the point of doing this um it's much more of that kind of melancholy doldrum type thing it's much more of feeling like you're stuck in this um like you're stuck almost in a fog and it's like everything is just really blah and you can't necessarily get motivated to do things or, and, and again, it fuels itself because for example, if I'm feeling blah and I don't record an episode, then my anxiety kicks in and I start feeling bad because I haven't released this episode and it fuels that cycle and it makes it worse. And so what I've had to learn myself is to, because I've always been a deep thinker and I'll sit there and I'll think about things and I'm constantly thinking about things. And I've had to learn at times when it gets, when you start getting in that spiral, just do whatever it takes to break that spiral. Now it could be just like listening to some music that, you know, will bring back good memories of someone or a situation you've been in or whatever, or it could be something as simple as forcing myself to get cleaned up and dressed and go into town and go and take myself to breakfast or go to the library or something and just try and break that routine. Now it doesn't always work and there's no magic bullets for it, but that's been one of the key things that I've found for my, my own benefit is when I'm in that kind of downward spiral, so to speak, just do something to try and fight against it and kind of break out of it. Because I always used to laugh growing up because you know the 90s 80s and 90s were a very different time and people always used to say oh if you're depressed just be happy and it's like it doesn't work that way it's a chemical imbalance in people's brains it's not actually something that people can just will okay you can't just will yourself to be happy no differently than you can just will yourself to not have cancer okay it's a chemical imbalance in your brain and the key thing that i always say to people who have depression or are just realizing that they, they're depressant, you've got to get out of the mindset of that it's like a passing phase. Depression is with you for life. And it's not to try and make victims out of us that have depression. It's just that it's like having diabetes, you know, and they always say to you, once you've got diabetes, you've got diabetes. It's the same with depression. And if you realize that and you start managing kind of the onset symptoms or you know what kind of triggers it, you can better manage it. Um, I've never really taken medication for it. The one thing that I took a bit that did help when I was younger was St. John's wort. But in general, I've never really medicated for it. And um, yeah, I, but, but that's one of the main things that I've learned is try and break the pattern when I'm in that downward mental spiral. So as I say to people, and I've talked about it on the show before, we don't always realize, like, for example, if you're listening to really negative music and then you're like, now I'm, you know, now I've just had a fight with my, with my girlfriend or boyfriend. And now I'm, we don't always connect the two. So sometimes it's like, well, first off, you know, stop, stop listening to this music for a while and maybe just listening to something uplifting or maybe stop watching like really dark and depressing movies I know that sounds really stupid because it's like, that's so simple, but we don't always make that connection because we don't always make that connection that what I'm experiencing around me is, is affecting me on that, on that subconscious level. And so for me, again, it's different for everyone. I mean, I've, I've also had a lot of anxiety issues. So when people say like, go for a walk in the sun, well, that's not always easy because I've got a certain neighbor I don't like. So I have to walk past her house. And I know that sounds stupid. And that sounds really corny, but that's that's my reality. Um, but I do find ways around it. So all I'm saying is, in general, when people see someone else suffering from whatever it is, we can't necessarily walk a mile in their shoes if we don't. But but try and show some empathy to say, so it's just like grief, right? One person loses a parent and they cope with it really easily. Now, that doesn't mean everyone does. I mean, I was in grief for a long time when my mom passed. And to this day, I miss her every day. So all I'm, uh, and it took, and, and again, it took me a long time to realize, like being a workaholic, for example, I'd get pissed off when people would say to me, oh, I've got to go home. And it's like, it's only been 12 hours, you know, what are you doing? You know, come on, I'm here. And again, we've, we, I think we as, as humans in general, just need to realize a bit that not everyone 
is, you know, we're not all wired the same way and we can't all cope with things. Some people can be really mentally strong and not physically strong and vice versa. So, yeah, the, but to me, that's the main thing is not everyone who's depressed wants to talk to someone. And that's another thing people don't always realize. I mean, just because I'm depressed doesn't mean I'm again, it doesn't mean I'm going to go and commit suicide. But making that offer still and saying, hey, look, if you need someone to talk to, I am here. Because like me, for example, depending on where I am in that kind of depressive cycle, there will come a time when I do need to talk to someone. And having knowing that I can talk to someone without burdening them, because again, when you're in a depressive cycle, at least for me, I don't want to be a burden. The last thing I want is to be a burden on other people. I don't want to make people feel bad for me or feels it, that's not what it's about. It's just sometimes you just need to put your thoughts out there and go, how, why am I seeing this the way I am? Or, and sometimes they can do something really positive. Like, you know, they can say, well, yeah, you know, okay, like you lost your job. But for example, in my situation, if I was depressed right now, I was like, okay, I'm not working. I don't have the income. They could say, okay, yeah, you lost your job. But on the other hand, you're getting to do this passion that you have that you're getting to do right now. You're getting to have this conversation. And sometimes I can self uh, medicate that way and tell myself that. But there are days I have bad days where it's like everything sucks, <laughs> like Eeyore, you know, from Winnie the Pooh. It's just like everything's gloom and doom. And, um, Again, I know everyone has to kind of find their own way to cope with those things. But the key thing to me, like I say, is just having gone through it for so long now, I'm very fortunate because I've got that body, quote unquote, that body of work to look back on and say, you've been through a lot worse. You've been in that situation where you've been ready to end your life and you didn't do it then. So looking, you know, your your your, your life is great now. Why would you do it now? Um, but But I also know that, that's to me, like, I don't know all of the things that went on around it, but like Robin Williams, oftentimes those people who are depressant, like me, on the outside, we're really happy and bubbly because we want other people to smile and laugh and we want other people to have joy. So sometimes it's the people who you least expect who have issues. And all I'm, all I'm saying to those people that are like me is if you get to that point where it seems like there is no end in sight and there's nothing good to live for, get some help, talk to someone. It can be professional. It can be friends and family. It can be me. It can be just anyone to talk to. Even if you go online and post an anonymous blog, you know, I don't know about everyone, but I've always felt better when I've done that. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you sharing all of that and the bits of words of wisdom that you threw in there as well. So thank you for that. Now, before I start to wrap things up, is there anything else that you would like to share with the listeners about your story? Uh, I guess kind of the, the the key points, and again, everyone's journey is everyone's journey. And again, this is something that I've had to learn on my journey. I didn't always look at it this way, but first off, as corny as it sounds, be kind to people because we never know what people are going through. I used to, and and I think a lot of us, I used to always think you'd meet someone and you go, that guy's a jerk or, you know, that, that lady's really a pain, but we don't know what they've gone through in their life. We don't know what they're coping with. They could have someone dying of a terminal disease. They could be ill themselves. They could have just lost a parent. We don't know what they're going through. So I'm not saying you got to be like lovey dovey and be their best friend, but try to at least mentally excuse them and don't let it weigh too heavy on you because I mean, look, me, I'm I'm a Libra and I see things in balance. And when somebody treats me like a jerk, I tend to get really pissed off about it because to me, it's like I haven't done anything to suffer this from you. But I've tried to learn in life that we don't know what others are going through. And when I've told my story or when I've talked about things to people I know, they're like, I had no idea. You see the same. So realizing that it's like, OK, well, the, especially people we don't know well. We don't know what they're going through. So that's one of the key things to me. The second thing is, although this doesn't work for everything and for everyone, try and let go. Now, what I mean by that, and I've covered it on my show before, I, I recounted a story of when I was young with my biological father, and I had a lot of kind of malice, and I... I blamed him for a lot of things, and um, I, I, I had a lot of internal pain over it. 
But when you see, for example, on the news, and it took me years to get this again, you see on the news and you've had like, let's say a young lady has been killed by someone and you'd have the parents saying, I forgive the murderer. When I was younger, I would always say, what a bunch of mugs. Why would you ever forgive that idiot who's taken your daughter's life? But what I realized as time went on is it's got nothing to do with the murderer. It's about them. Because if they don't forgive him and they don't move on with their life, they'll forever be eaten up with that, with that blackness inside, for lack of a better term. And so, for example, the story that I told was when I got to the point where I just like basically let the stuff with my dad go, I likened it to falling off a bridge holding a cinder block and the cinder block's pulling you to the bottom. And it's like, well, either I can let go of the cinder block or I can drown with it. And I was actually smart enough for once in my life to let go of the cinder block. So what I'm saying, folks, is I know it's not easy. I, I mean, I've had familial and, and, and partner issues and everything else with the best of them. But at the end of the day, especially if they're no longer in your life, the person who's suffering is you because, yeah, you're saying, oh, what a piece of crap they are and everything else. But the reality is nine times out of 10, they're, they're not, you know, they're not thinking about it. They're not dwelling on it. You are. So I know it doesn't work and it's not as easy as just, but if you in stages, just start letting it go. I find that life becomes much better, uh, much more worth living because you've removed that kind of from your system. And the third thing is, for me, it's like I'm a pleaser. So I do my best to help and please people. Those people that out there that are givers and, and, and try and help people, there's nothing wrong with being a giver. But givers have to set limits because takers never do. So if you've got someone in your life and you're constantly helping them and you're constantly doing things for them and they never reciprocate and they don't appreciate what you do, it doesn't mean they're a bad person. What it means is that you need to start setting boundaries and balances on your life because then when you get miserable and you go, oh, my life sucks and I've never got any time, it's like it's that whole thing where it's like, you unmask who the problem is and, oh, it's a mirror. It's me, you know, because I'm not setting any boundaries. And that's another thing that I've had to learn. It's okay to say no, or it's okay to say not right now. Uh, I need some me time. Um, and again, no offense to any of the males out there, but most most givers are female and women tend to to end up They'll just give and give and they'll help and help. And men oftentimes can be oblivious to that. And we'll just do the whole, oh, well, she, she, she doesn't mind. You know, it's like, it's not about minding. It's that they're doing it to try and make us happy. So, and that can be a partnership that can be brother and sister. It can just be friends. It can be mother. And, you know, so all I'm saying folks is it's okay to make time for yourself. That's one of the things that I went through. Um, when my mom passed and I actually, I was fortunate, I ended up getting some excellent um, professional help through, through through my work. And that's one of the things she identified straight away. She's like, because she said to me, if you had, if I gave you a thousand dollars, what would you do? And I started naming things I'd do for my partner, things I'd get her, things I'd get from my friend. And she's like, what would you do for you? And then I had to sit there and go, that's a good question. So I've had to learn that like if I go out and I have a coffee by myself, it's okay. I can go and treat myself to a coffee or I can go and have a meal without having to bring a meal back home because I feel guilty about it. Make time for yourself, little things. Even if, like I say, if it's your favorite cup of coffee, if it's having a piece of cake, like life is for living. And, and yeah, of course, we want to live a long time and you got to watch your weight and everything else. But sometimes just eat the damn cake is what I'm saying. Oh, well, that is some great advice to end on and a, a lot of good information there. Now, at the end, with all of my guests, I ask a random question that doesn't have to do with whatever we've been talking about. So because while we are recording this, the Olympics are still going on, though they will be done by the time this episode is posted. My question for you is, what is your favorite Olympic sport? So you mean summer or you mean at all? Uh, th that's completely up to you. Well, I'm from the ice and snow, so uh, I always had a soft spot in my heart for the Winter Olympics. And uh, so I always enjoyed like the growing up, especially I always enjoyed like the cross country skiing and things like that. But I mean, with the Summer Olympics, actually for such a small country, so we've got five million people 
And I'll just tell you, because I've got this little cool Olympic app on my phone, and my favorite uh, Olympic sports right now are anything we do well in. And for such a small country, we've actually got already six gold medals, four silver medals, and five bronze medals. And again, we've got five million people in this country. So I know in the U.S., we were always we always had the high medal counts, and I still root for the U.S., but I'm going to be 100% honest. If there's a U.S. competitor and a New Zealand competitor, I root for us because we're a small country, and you guys are going to get all the gold medals in the world. But, um, but yeah, I, I have been watching a good bit of the Olympics, and um, uh, I enjoy things like um, oh, probably more of the traditional stuff um, just because I grew up with it. Like I like watching baseball in the Olympics and basketball. And like I was watching the hammer throw last night. But yeah, if I had to pick one and you said you can only have one JT, then it would probably be cross country skiing. When I was growing up, that one, for whatever reason, always felt drawn to that sport. All right, that brings this episode to a close. I will be leaving a Linktree website in the description for JT. So that'll bring you to his website, Instagram, all of the good information where you can find his podcast and more about him. And as he's mentioned a couple of times, you know, he is open to people reaching out to him if they need someone to just talk to. Um, so the email address will also be in the description for the fortunate podcast that email will be there so feel free to reach out to him and check out all of his good information and of course if you'd like to connect with this podcast the website is in the description it'll bring you to all of our social media instagram facebook linkedin and the email is there of course as well so if you'd like to be a guest i'd love to have you so feel free to just send me an email and if you'd like to support the podcast you can do that monetarily and those links are in the description as well So thank you so much, JT, for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next week, bye. Thank you so much for having me on. Goodbye, everyone. Take care.